welcome. It's a great pleasure to welcome so many colleagues and friends to BGC for what promises to be a very entertaining evening. I'm Deborah Crone, Chair of Academic Programs and the Curator of the Exhibition, Staging the Table in Europe 1500 to 1800, which is the inspiration for this evening's program. Before I introduce the speaker and players, I wanted to say a few words about the exhibition, which I hope many of you have seen or will go visit later this evening or another time. You all have cards on your seat for a free visit. It's an exploration of books and carving knives and forks and table linens from all over Europe, focusing on the role of professionals who carved meats, fowl and fruits at the table and provided folded napkins and other elements for the staged table. Illustrations of knives and forks and the carvers who wielded them, as well as suggested shapes for centerpieces filled numerous books. The connection with musical culture emerged through an important character in the story that unfolds in the gallery. Georg Philipp Harsdorfer was likely the first German to translate the Italian carving and folding books into German, where they were bestsellers for a hundred years into the mid 18th century. Harsdorfer was much better known, however, for his achievements as a literary figure author of the first German opera libretto, some of the music for which we'll hear this evening. As you go through the exhibition, when you go through the exhibition, you'll notice the many banquet illustrations that include musicians who are accompanying the festivities. Our performers this evening include Ivan Day and the early music ensemble Sonambula. The format for the evening is kind of a tasting menu We'll have three flights, each consisting of a, a short talk by Ivan, followed by a musical interlude and explanation. So Sonambula, who will be entering the hall soon. That's their cue. Try that again. Sonambula. Are they there? Oh, here they are. <laughs> yes. Um, OK, directed directed by Elizabeth Weinfield, um, is a historically informed ensemble that brings to light unknown music for various combinations of early instruments. The group has appeared at a wide array of venues, often in conjunction with historically themed exhibitions and programs, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where they've been ensemble in residence, the Frick Collection, the Hispanic Society, Princeton University, Columbia University, and early music festivals um, around the country. Ivan Day, uh, I'm sure is known to many of you, as an independent historian of the social history and culture of food, he has carved out a unique niche providing exquisite reconstructions of historical table settings, which combine museum objects with accurate recreations of period dishes. His work has been exhibited in many major museums here and in the UK um, and Europe, including the Getty Research Institute, the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Gardner Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and the BGC where he created a table for the exhibition Fragile Diplomacy, Mice and Porcelain for the European Courts in 2007. He's also a frequent participant in academic conferences on related topics where we've had a chance to meet over the years and was a speaker at a symposium here in 2013. So that's who, who the cast of characters is. Um, I'm now going to invite Ivan Day to come to the podium to speak. So thank you very much, Deborah. Um, this evening will make a lot of sense if you have been to the exhibition. And if you haven't, you must go to it because it will all fall into place. So the exhibition contains a lot of knives and a lot of books about how to use these knives. But most of these knives were used by a high-ranking servant in a noble household who actually carved for his master. It might be a monarch or a high-ranking aristocrat. 
where they actually carve the meat at the table as a kind of conjuring performance because they would impale, for instance, a bird like a pigeon on a very long carving fork and then cut it in midair. It was a style of carving known as in alto, in midair. And magically they would cut with a very sharp knife and the Lord's dinner would sort of land on a plat <laughs> platter. And then with another type of knife, somebody else, maybe not the carver, would present it and slide it onto the plate of the princeling or the princess so that they could eat it. And they would even carve fruits by impaling them on a fork and cutting incredible flowers and wonderful geometric knot patterns into the orange. I'm not in the main going to talk very much about that. Go to the exhibition and read the literature up there. But I'm going to talk about knives. And on the screen at the moment, you've got this remarkable knife and fork, which is a very early set for eating with, not for carving. It's for somebody to actually eat with. And it is Venetian. And we know about just how show-offy Venetians were in the 16th century. But maybe it was never used. It may be something that was in a Kunstkammer, an actual display, you know, with this incredible impractical um, coral handle. But I suspect that somebody did have it. And it was the Renaissance version of an iPhone. It was a piece of jewellery that you showed off with. So when you sat down with your friends, they just had common Baltic amber handles on their knives. <laughs> and you produced this coral one, you know, so it put you really in, in the picture. But you see, Ordinary people didn't have fancy knives. They had very simple ones. The other element I want to bring in here because of Elizabeth and Sonambula is the fact there's an incredible analogy between studying music and recreating it and studying culinary history and trying to recreate food. For instance, um, in the past... We had musical notation, which meant that everyone could play the piece. This There's this wonderful frottola, which is a, an Italian four-part secular song. And just look how beautiful this score is. It's just an absolute gem. But of course, also in culinary culture, we have something very similar. We have recipes. This is a, a recipe for a lamprey, which is this dreadful carnivorous sort of creature. You get them in the Great Lakes. Uh, they eat or suck the blood out of other fishes. But they were the most aristocratic fish for dining on. They, they loved them. Um, and this is actually from 1590. It's a medieval recipe to cook them. Um, so if you're a scholar of culinary history, you've got recipes. If you're a scholar of musical history, you've got scores. Often they take an amazing amount of interpretation because they're often in a language that, you know, we're not familiar with. But there's a technology also in music. There's the instruments. That's the thing that you have to have to play them on. And the consort this evening have got, you know, these wonderful viols, which are sort of precursors of the violin family. Um, and you can't play this kind of music on modern instruments. You've got to have the instrument. So with culinary culture, you need the tools too. So for instance, there's a bit of culinary technology here. That strange looking clockwork thing is mounted on my kitchen. It's one of many that I have. And it automatically turns spits by clockwork. Mm -hmm. And it makes a huge difference to cook. It's even got a bell like a microwave because when you can look at the bottom of it, can you see a little bell like you might get on a bicycle? When the, It's run by a weight, and when the weight gets close to the ground, the bell rings to tell you that you've got to wind it up. Otherwise, your, your pousson or your pigeon is going to burn. And I just want to make some links with music and cutlery. These are extraordinary objects. They're incredibly rare. Um, they're known as notation knives, and we're not entirely sure how they were used, but they would be on a high-status table, and you can see that they're engraved with a musical score. The one at the top has actually got the um, benediction, which is the prayer before you dine, and the one below has got the grace. And they had sets of them, 
so that four diners could sing the different parts of a polyphonic grace in Latin. But they could double up as a presenter knife. Can you see that they have got a very wide blade, um, but they also have got a very pointed sharp end. So it meant you could actually pick up a piece of meat with them and serve it to the noble Lord after the grace had been sung or the benediction had been sung. Carving knives um, were basically used by these high-ranking servants. They were often noblemen themselves, often looking for a job in a, in a wealthy household. But they didn't really become widespread, you know, in smaller or, or lower status families. But they had their uses. For instance, this is an ox roast in London on the frozen Thames in 1683. And um, it would feed about a thousand people. Um, and it's on the ice. It's actually, everyone was amazed because the fire didn't go down into the river through the ice. But they built a palisade around it and would charge entrance just to watch it. And, and you had to pay extra if you wanted to have a slice of ox. I discovered this carving set. It's a Victorian one, um, a few years ago in a big house in England, and it was made to commemorate the wedding of the Duke of Portland to this wonderful Duchess, his Duchess Winifred, who was very beautiful. And I found it in a kitchen room, and I couldn't believe it. The next day, I discovered this photograph of the ox being roasted, and you can see very, very clearly that the scale of that knife and fork um, I've got one from another household myself, actually, which is like a samurai sword. <laughs> but it was ceremonial. You just cut the, the, the first cut and served it to your principal guest. But it was a remnant of this much earlier culture of carving. A lot, lot of fun. Um, now, the thing is that your, your knife, which you ate with before the 17th century, was all you had. You might have a spoon, but you didn't have a fork. The fork didn't really come in until the early 17th century and didn't really become widely adopted until really the end of the 17th century. And often a bride was given a set of two knives for her wedding. It was called a bride knife. And this is, and basically it was almost like the wedding ring. It was a declaration of fidelity to her husband. So she would eat all her meals with this gift that he'd given to her on her wedding day. And this is remarkable because... This is the bride knife of a wonderful um, Antwerp artist called Clara Peters. And if you look carefully, you can actually see her signature is engraved on the side of it. A few years ago, at an exhibition that I worked on in Cambridge, which Deborah was involved in as well, um, we found this in the store. It's, it's this remarkable knife made by this family called the De Bry family, and it's got this wonderful silver and yellow handle. And what's extraordinary here it is, this is a very early example of one with a fork, an eating fork. Um, so th you've got to look at these things as being objects that expressed your status. You know, having, for instance, a knife which has Noah and a sheaf, which is the whale that he comes out of, was the equivalent in, you know, mannerist Europe of owning a Lamborghini, you know, <laughs> or a Maserati. It, it said you'd arrived socially. Now, what I'm going to do in a moment is this. I've brought with me some remarkable, very simple, ordinary knives, not the kind of things that elites had, but what us, I mean, some of you may be elites, I'm certainly not. You know. um, I've got a knife here, I don't know whether it's possible to get that on the screen, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to pass it round. I want you to hold these and think about who may have actually used it to eat. This dates from 1400, so it's very early, and it's got a handle made of something called gudgeon, which was the root of the box tree. It was very, very cheap. So this is really a peasant knife. But peasant knives were ornamented in a much more simpler way without the precious metal. So Andrew is going to send it around. I'm only going to pass four around, but I want to count four in at the end. <laughs> so don't slip them into your pocketbook. Yeah. Now, 
the, the next one, which is very, very tiny, when you can see it, the first one actually is there on the screen. Can you see on the far left? That is the 1400 one. The one next to that is from the time of Henry VIII. But can you see the little tiny one, the third one, which is going to come round now? And I really want you to sort of stroke this because it's a little child's knife. We don't know if it belonged to a girl or a boy, but they would have had a sheath that they wore. And it's about three inches long. And that child would have eaten with that. What you did, you had it in a, a little sheaf and you took it out. And um, the way that you used it was this. You didn't have a fork at this time. This is what I'm looking for. You didn't have a fork. You wore your napkin, which is much longer than this, like on your left shoulder. And you basically used the tip of the knife. Once you'd cut your meat, you often had to use your fingers to hold it down because you didn't have a fork on the plate you speared it and you could eat it off the tip of the knife that's why the very early knives like the first four here have got a, a point when the fork came in you start getting knives that have got a rounded end can you see the the, the fifth one along is from 1690s it's actually dated and it's got the name on the silver kind of bit of the finial at the bottom, but it's got a round blade. So what you did, you have your, you ate with a knife, you got a, your finger, your left finger's holding it down, you then wiped it on your napkin like that, okay? And that's why we stopped doing that when the fork came in, we started putting the lap, napkin on our lap. But we still, we go in a restaurant, they usually put the napkin down on the left-hand side of your plate. And that's like a, a kind of historic vapour trail going back into Renaissance <laughs> dining practice. I'm going to pass around one more knife, and then we're going to hear some music, actually. Um, so by the time you get into the 18th century, the Enlightenment period, you can see the last two. There's a set there. I've got the fork. I'm not going to say that it's dangerous. You're not going to get that. <laughs> and these originally were just used for carving or for spiking sweeties, you see, so you can get syrup on your fingers. But can you see now it's got a scimitar blade and a pistol grip handle, and it's completely, you know, you're not using that to spear because... You've got this guy here, okay? So Andrew is going to put these. Are, this is from about 1760, and um, it's from the Worcester manufacturer. Got, don't drop it. It's got a porcelain handle. It's very, very precious. So, um, and we'll count them in at this end. So that's enough of me, um, and I'm going to hand over to this absolutely wonderful consort, Viles Sonambula. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Elizabeth Weinfield. Um, I'll say a few words about each of the set of pieces that we'll play. We'll, we'll also pl be with you for three different sort of courses, as it were. So there's a very long history of music associated with with dining. And interestingly, throughout this history, we can sort of glance the evolution of, of instruments. So we're going to go chronologically. We're going to start with Shine and excerpts from the Banchetto Musicale. We'll then um, um, go into some early German opera, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and we'll end with selections from Telemann's Tafel music. So there's something particularly curious about some of this very early repertory, um, which is that so much music in circulation in the 16th and 17th centuries did not actually indicate part assignments for the instruments. And if we look at this, here's the title page of uh, Schein's Banchetto Musicale, 1617. And if we look at the very first page of um, one of the canto parts, we don't see sort of violin or cornetto indicated. We just see indicated the, the range of the instrument. Um, and we know, that, um, uh, we know that we're looking at a high range um, instrument based on the clef. So we're looking at a C clef, at the very end, um, right underneath the word paduana or pavin. Um, this little, um, looks like a dead fly over there, but it's sort of at the bottom of this, telling us where the, the note C is. So clefs designate ranges, but they don't designate um, instruments, but they do give us a clue about what would have been used. So the first series of pieces we have for you this evening, we see um, two 
of these high clef parts. We see one part with a, a middle clef, and then we see another part with um, the equivalent of the bass clef on the bottom. So two high-pitched instruments, one um, middle voice and one bassus voice. And yet there is an inherent flexibility also written into this diversity, written into the repertoire. That's, that's a lot of fun to experiment with. And it also meant that these pieces, which would have, of course, been printed, had a higher chance for circulation and for use. So Schein, one of the greatest German composers of the 17th century before Bach, um, He's not terribly well known, certainly not as well known as his contemporary Schutz. Possibly this is because he didn't live as long as Schutz did. He was also less, less prolific than Schutz, but he wrote stunning music for mixed instruments. Um, and so some of the very first uh, 17th century music for, for feasting. It's also some of the earliest German music that is inspired by the great uh, Venetian tradition of polychoral music handed down through the Venetian composer Giovanni Gabrielli. <clears throat> so we can see here uh, a picture that is in the exhibition, a scene of dining in Nuremberg after Joachim van Sandrart. And we can see in this, in this picture the musicians placed in different spaces within the larger banqueting hall, which is an arrangement that actually resembles that of the great polychoral tradition in, in Venice, the polychoral tradition, polychoral music in Venice, music that is written for what is known as the cori spazzati, or divided choirs, ensembles that are divided into subgroups and they're divided physically also into the space and they engage in this way with the music. So different groups of instruments that sometimes play separately, sometimes play in dialogue and sometimes come together at various climactic moments, sort of an early example of site-specific music, if you like. This idea of, of placing or of staging musicians in a space, discoursing across the room like Ivan and I are doing tonight. So Shine is coming out of this tradition, and as such, there's a sort of inherent theatricality written into this music that's manifest as rhetorical, as relational, as conversational. And which, of course, also underscores the very essence of what ensemble playing is all about. So we have a real case here for instrumental music kind of sticking its neck out in the beginning of the 17th century, when opera is starting to encroach, when opera is starting to really vie for power. So the collection of suites in the Ben Cato Music Halle have titles like Paduana or Pavin or, or Galliard. We'll play an entrada and a Paduana momentarily. And at first glance, we think of, of dance music, the Galliard, dance music. This was Queen Elizabeth I's favorite dance. She danced three of them every morning with live music in her chambers. And just the thought of dancing while eating, um, especially eating pigeon, <laughs> just, just makes one feel horribly nauseated. Uh, but it's important to remember that these are these are functional dance forms. The, the shape, the emotional quality of the dance lending a character to the piece. Later, of course, J.S. Bach does the same thing. Those of you who know the solo pieces by Bach for violin, for cello, or his orchestral suites know that he borrows from the tradition of the dance. Also, his suites are inspired by the Anglo-German consort repertory. And so through them, we see the English idiom of concert music shining through, for example, Dowland, Holborn, which was becoming very popular in Germany in the early 17th century, partly through the circulation of English music, but also partly through um, the, well, the circulation of, of English composers, uh, composers like William Braid, Thomas Simpson, who, who traveled um, to Germany. So the variety of instrumentation, any treble instrument is appropriate for this music. For example, the recorder, the cornetto, the treble gamba, or the violin, which we're using tonight. <clears throat> so for our top lines, we have on the violin Jude Ziliak on the top treble, Alana Ruoko on the second treble, 
I'll be playing the tenor viola da gamba, which I'll talk about in the next section. And my colleague, Matt Zucker, will be playing the bass viola da gamba. So selections from Banchetto Musicale.
so music is, is very intimately connected with dining and having a good time. They didn't have Netflix, they didn't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> so they, they entertained themselves with, in another dimension. Before I start on this, I just want to make a little confession, actually, um, mainly to Elizabeth and her colleagues. When I was a student, I had a very close friend who was a musical instrument restorer, a man called Andrew Dipper, who is married to a violin dealer called Claire Givens. I'm sure you probably know that they are. And Andrew, Andrew and I were great pals, and he, he worked for a musical instrument um, kind of dealer in London called Tony Bingham. And I used to visit Andrew at his workshop. And I said, what, what's coming in then? He said, oh, we've got this incredible... Um, dancing master's kit, which is a little, you know, tiny little portable thing in the violin family. It's like a rebec, a medieval instrument, but it was used for dancing masters used to teach people to dance, so they go around from village to village. But it was made by a man called Henry J, who was a viol maker. And I said, where is it then? He said, oh, I put it down somewhere. And I was just about to sit down. And it was on the chair. I was the man who nearly sat on a Henry J. <laughs> um, so all my little presentations, I've tried to weave a musical note into them. And I'm calling this one Dance, Dining with Early Moderns, or Imbibing with Veronese, Rembrandt and Monkeys. I'm going to turn my attention away from eating to drinking. And I want you to look at this. This is actually a handle of a, a, a carving knife, believe it or not. And you can see this couple. They look very happy. They've got a glass. What you can't see is that the man has got his foot on a barrel. Um, and there's sort of, it's related to the idea of Dionysius. They're imbibing and having a great deal of fun. But what I want you to look at there is the way in which the glass is being held. Can you see? I've got one here. Um, you hold it by the foot. And you drink it by tilting it back carefully. And then you can't put it back down on the table. Can you see? You have to put it into your left hand. Um, and I'm going to explore how that happened, just how you did it. But I've, you know, got some apprentices, well, they're, they're kind of assistants, really, who are going to show me how to do it. Um, can you see in this lovely Dutch painting, the woman is holding this lovely drinking glass again by the foot. That, If you look at all of these paintings from the late 16th, 17th century, all over Europe, You'll never see anyone holding a wine glass like we do by the stem. That just was not done. It, it wasn't good form. Even people, people lower down the social scale. But in fact, this is a, I, when I knew Andrew Dipper, I bought this etching in London. It's in my collection. And it's by this extraordinary Flemish artist called P Peter van der Borst. And this is just a detail of it. You can see music going on. Look, there's a viol there being played and lute um, and a bit of flirtation, some people singing. But look at the, 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 the drinking glasses. They're like cake stands. They're flat. Um, they're called tazze. They're, it's an Italian way of having a means of drinking which showed out you off if you couldn't do it properly. Because if you held it up and you tilted it, if you didn't know how to drink from it, you ended up down your rough or your very expensive embroidered doublet. And look at this, more music for you. This is one of the earliest depictions of a consort of shawms, which is a reed instrument that was played outside because it was incredibly raucous. And what I want you to look at are the musicians and the servants serving the food, because the notables who are sitting at the table are all wearing ruffs, and they're very, I mean, they're not completely dressed, actually. Some of them, you can see bits that you wouldn't normally want to. <laughs> but it's actually a satire on courtly behaviour. And this fashion of using these strange glasses, which are really difficult to drink from, um, was spreading all over Europe, and they're just taking the mickey out of it. Um, so basically, this is a satire on high status courtly behavior. And here is somebody toasting. Okay. And look at this. 
this is wonderful because can you see there's a, a wine cooler there which has got two what we call pilgrim flasks in it with chains hanging and he's pouring the wine in a very mannered way from this covered wine flagon, which is probably made of pewter or possibly silver. Um, so this is really quite an extraordinary thing. So what I want to do um, is to demonstrate to you how they drank from one of these strange vessels. They made them in Venice out of glass, but they also probably made them from precious metals. And here you see... Um, a group of slightly more high-status people than the monkeys. Um, this is a detail of the Marriage Feast of Cana by Paolo Veronese, this great Venetian artist. And what you've got to bear in mind is that this is just a detail at the front. You can see one of the drinking tats are being held by its foot by a servant who's about to pass it to this very, very beautifully dressed notable. And... What you've got to realise is this is the moment that Christ turns this water that's in there into wine. So the artist is trying to draw your attention to it by using this very fashionable kind of drinking style. But what is extraordinary is um, you notice that the right hand of the servant is passing the wine to the right hand of the drinker. But the third person back is a gentleman in a wonderful blue costume, and he's holding it in his left hand by the stem. So what's going on here? He is about to lift it up, to put it into his right hand. It's the only way you can do it. There's nothing written about this, but I figured this out myself by actually doing it for real. Here is an absolutely beautiful example of one of these tats. So this is a friend of mine has got this for sale at the moment. It's um, absolutely beautiful. I'm not. I don't get any commission, so you know. Um, but you can see how delicate they are, and can you see how shallow the bowl is at the top? So you can't really overfill it. But um, a few years ago, I created this. Um, it's a kind of. It's based on a painting by Jan Bruegel the Elder. Also, um, it's in the, the Prado, and he was helped by Peter Paul Rubens because Jan Bruegel couldn't paint figures. And the painting is of an allegory of taste, and it's got a table just like this with these extraordinary pies, which have got swans and peacocks and other birds on top. But if you look very, very, very carefully um, at the, um, the far corner on your left, you can, sorry, on your right, you can see a drinking tat with wine in it. Here it is. They actually let me put some wine in it. The conservator at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, he said, how did, you, how did they use them? I said, I'll show you. Really? So we put some wine in it. And here you go. This is me <laughs> having a go. Now, I haven't got a priceless, really beautiful, very fragile... Venetian drinking tats are with me. So what I've done a couple of weeks ago back in England is using this recipe here. What it says here is this is a recipe from a book that was published in in Venice in the middle of the 16th century. And it's a book of secrets and it tells you how to make a sugar paste which you can make cups, tondi little roundels, plates, glasses, and you can use them to serve a meal. And then you can eat them to save the washing up. <laughs> and this is an English translation of that. I'll read it to you. To make a paste of sugar, whereof a man may make all manner of fruits and other fine things of their form, as platters, dishes, glasses, cups, and such like things, wherewith you may furnish a table. And when you have done, eat them up. <laughs> a pleasant thing for them that sit at the table. So down here somewhere, I've got a bottle of wine. <laughs> and here we have, you see, you can't pick it up other than picking it up by the stem, you see. So I put that down, I pick it up, and then to get it absolutely right, you've got to hold it by the foot. So this is how early moderns drank. Now, I'm right-handed, so it's going to be a little bit difficult for me. So I'm going to ask Andrew to come forward. And I can't do any 
Marriage Feast of Cain and Miracles. <laughs> uh, not too much, just, you know, very, keep going. Whoop, that's enough, okay. <laughs> I've got another demonstration to do, so. I... <laughs> okay, so what you do is, uh, should I do it in profile, because it might be easier for you to see. You, you take it up to your mouth, keeping it absolutely level. Okay, it's not easy. It's so easy to tilt it and end up with a whole mess and everyone's laughing at you and they know that you're a monkey rather than a courtier, you know. Okay, so that's my first drinking um, demonstration. In the past, people think, did things very, very differently. In the 16th and 17th century, your whole life, if you were a nobleman or a noblewoman, was choreographed. You had to know how to dance, you had to know how to, to shoot with a crossbow, to fence, to ride a horse. Um, they rode them beautifully. The, 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 the dressage we still have, you know, that incredible mandard way, evolves from the way in which you rode a horse. And it, it, it sort of pointed you out as being somebody who was ennobled. You were somebody who was up there rather than down there with the simian, with the monkeys. Um, but what I'd like to do now is to... There it is. That's um, an example of it. What I want to do now is actually just go down the social scale considerably, actually, because this is one of my favourite paintings by Rembrandt. And what it depicts is Rembrandt himself is modelling with his wife, Saskia, and she's playing the harlot and he's playing the prodigal son and they're carousing, you know, the big flirtation going on there. And he's drinking out of a specialist glass that was more used down at peasant level in the local taverns. And it was designed for a drinking game. So we're talking here 17th century low countries, but also Germany, they had them as well. It was called a Pasklas. And I've got one here. This is not made of sugar. And it's not an original one, it's a reproduction. You can buy them in the um, airport shop at Schiphol in Amsterdam. <laughs> Again, I get no commission, you know. <laughs> so the idea is this. You'll notice that it's got a series of lines at intervals down the glass. And I haven't filled this one up completely, but the idea was this. You had your glass, you drank from it, and you had to drink it exactly to the line, you see? Which is very difficult to do because you can't judge where it's going as you drink. If you go below the line or above it, not exactly to it, you have to have another go. <laughs> so you can imagine that a Dutch you know, person who looked at this painting knew exactly what was happening here. This is a low-life tavern game where people got absolutely sloshed <laughs> because it's very difficult to control and the atmosphere that, that Rembrandt van Rijn is trying to create here is for a group of people who know all about this they see it in the streets every day with people staggering drunk about and it sets the scene because do you notice also behind Saskia there is a peacock pie can you see that um, which you know you'll see on a on a wonderful vinyl in in the in the gallery, and you saw one there in my re reproduction. So this sets the scene of a low life kind of drunken reverie, basically. Um, so I'm going to have a go. I'm I promise you I am not going to have any more. <laughs> but let's see how difficult it is. So basically, can you see that, that Rembrandt is actually holding it about there, which makes it a lot easier. If you hold it by the foot, it really becomes very difficult. So let's have a go, okay? So mm, it's, you've got to work out how many centiliters it is, you know? <laughs> Does the phone count? <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to show you one more image, which actually puts Rem... It's by a slightly later uh, Dutch artist, a Flemish artist called Adrian van Ostade, 
And this is the kind of social level that this game took place at. He's put it in the painting because, you know, the, the, the prodigal son is sort of cavorting with harlots and drunkards. So, you know, but they're dressed in finery and there's a feast on a table behind them. But this is the kind of low life scene. Can you see the gentleman there on your right, on the far right, who is having a go and the other guy is wanting to have a go as well, you know. So that puts it into its context. So that was basically eating and drinking. And the next thing is a basically about partying, having fun. So I'm going to hand back to Sonambula and they're going to play you some more wonderful period music. Thank you. <laughs> Some of you might know this instrument across the park at the Met, and you're, you see two of them here tonight. So we actually have two families of instruments on stage tonight, and this this cross pollination. Um, across the social boundary um, was actually quite common, particularly in the 17th century as the violin and violin family instruments were defining themselves as solo instruments and gaining ground both in courtly and in chamber ensembles. <clears throat> and Jude will talk a little bit more about the violin and the history of the violin in our third vignette. But in the 17th century, it was really the, the viol or the viola da gamba that was still being used at court and, and in the home. So the viol is a European bowed and notably fretted string instrument. It has some very distinctive features. Actually, maybe Matt can hold his up. Um, it typically has a, an arched bridge, which distinguishes it from the lira di braccio, which is an older Italian instrument. And it has sloped shoulders, which are different from those of the violin. It has a flat back, as opposed to the round back of the violin. And uh, the violin has four strings, but viols have six and sometimes seven strings. It grows a string in France. So they... Oh, also, they're they're strung with both with the frets and the strings are they're strung with with gut, either lamb or or beef, not cat. That's a myth, not cat gut. <clears throat> so they likely come from Spain, and the probable Spanish predecessor of the viol is the vihuelo de arco, essentially a bowed guitar. So at some point, we think someone put a bow to a guitar and the bridge becomes arched, and it, with the arched bridge, it's able to play one note at a time. And they're constructed from flat pieces of wood. They're joined together at the seams. And its neck is also wider than that of violin family instruments. So we see following Alexander VI's ascension in 1492, a surge of Catalan culture to Rome. And we see also an influx of Spanish musicians and instruments to the papal states, many of whom actually were itinerant Spanish Jews. We know that Isabella d'Este was one early collector of the viola da gamba, and in fact, it's in her letters to her antiquities dealers that we see the first mention of this instrument, at least in northern Italy. So it develops a consort repertory in, uh, throughout the Italian peninsula in the 16th century, meaning a repertoire that sort of grows out of what probably would have been vocal music for an ensemble of like instruments. There is a smaller instrument. So this is the tenor size, the middle size. And it's a consort instrument, meaning it, it um, comes in different sizes and they're meant to be played together. And the goal of playing um, in consort is to achieve a unified sound. So it makes its way to England during the Anne Boleyn years. Anne Boleyn loved music. And the, the tutors become great patrons of the, of the instrument. So an, an English repertory grows and evolves into the 17th century. 
In the German-speaking world, the vial becomes part of what we call a mixed consort, so ensembles that are comprised of different families of instruments. We saw this um, in the Schein, for example. And then later into the 17th century, the lowest vial, the one that Matt is playing, becomes part of a a prolific solo tradition, and in France it gets a low A string, which lets the player do more, it lets, the, it lets composers do more. We think of the piano growing, acquiring keys during Beethoven's time. <clears throat> Bach also wrote for the viola da gamba. Uh, his two passions, for example, the John Passion, the Matthew Passion, both have very difficult solos for the viola da gamba. In fact, you may have seen Matt play the Matthew Passion last week uh, with the New York Philharmonic. Um, uh, but by Bach's day, the viol is actually um, already an antique instrument. So in the 17th century, we also see the viol take up the play, take a place in the opera orchestra. And here is where we get a connection, a direct connection to the staging the table exhibition here at Bard. So our next selection for you will feature <clears throat> some music by the opera Zelewig, which was written in 1644 in Nuremberg with music by Staden and a libretto by Harsdorfer, who is one of the draftsmen responsible for a number of the images that are associated with dining that you have probably already seen in the Staging the Table exhibition. So in 1644, in the, in the year that this, this opera was published, Harsdorfer, together with a group of poets and theologians in Nuremberg, founded a literary society called the Pegnitz Flower Society. It was firmly Lutheran in orientation, and one of the common topics of discussion was the difficulty of, of translating Italian pastoral poetry into German which of course is a very timely conversation considering the revival of antiquity, which is firmly in the air upon which so much Italian opera is so deeply dependent. One of the society's first publications was Harsdorfer's Frauenzimmer Gesprachspiele, um, uh, in which this opera appears in volume number four. So this is a collection of conversation games that were designed to teach women morals using language and plays of language. A complete manuscript of this score survives, and so it places this as actually the oldest, germ oldest surviving German opera. Uh, Schutz wrote one actually in 1627, but we don't have it sadly enough. So German opera, about a generation after the first experimenters in Italy, Monteverdi and so on, so it might be tempting to say that this work reflects a new awareness or an imitation maybe of Italian opera style. And indeed that would thematically link this back to the shine that we played earlier. But there's something distinctly German about this work. For one, it seems that the work is deemed um, a Zingspiel, the word Zingspiel appears on the original cover page. A Zingspiel is a genre of opera in which characters sometimes sing and sometimes speak. For example, Mozart's magic flute is a Zingspiel. However, it appears as though Zelewig was actually sung throughout. And so this term holds actually quite a different meaning here. It becomes a kind of signifier for German opera as distinct from uh, or separate from Italian opera, so not the Zingspiel genre of later Mozartian times. This is also reminiscent of some of the books that Deborah has in her exhibition with German fracture mixed in with Italian um, script, preserving the, the look of the language, but also preserving the, the, the politics, if you like, of the language, the, the separateness, the values that the language represents. In fact, Harsdorfer himself says, uh, but quote, these characters all sing, and from behind, this cur from behind the curtain, a string accompaniment can be heard in order to render the voice even lovelier. For these reasons, the pastoral poem, he continues, might be termed a zingspiel, end of quote. So perhaps a German version of the pastoral. 
So we see Harsdorfer, the banquet draftsman here in full force, evoking the setup of the feast with instruments off to the side, yet integral to the action, and yet also non-diegetic, removed from the action. And in this sense, Wagner is really his true successor, completely removing the instrumentalists from the audience's sight, relegating them to the pit orchestra. So some excerpts from Zelewig. So the opera portrays Trugewald, a satyr, and Selewig, who's a nymph. Nymphs are a common symbol of the pastoral in German dramatic genres. They become actors, advisors for the mortals that they're protecting or uh, convey moralizing principles. We'll open with a symphonia and a trio from Act Two. We then go to the chorus of the nymphs with another symphonia, um, act three, Selevig at this point is being led astray into a world of debauchery and, and Dionysian sensuousness um, and evil, but she ultimately holds her ground. And then at the end um, of act three, Sinfonia mit Violon and the, the chorus of the angels, um, Selevig is converted and all is well. Thank you. Just a note, apologies to, for shouting, that the first little tiny thing that we're going to play should really be played on those raucous outdoor shams. We don't have any. We didn't bring them. <laughs> I hope you don't mind if we tune again. Our gut strings go out of tune very frequently.
so extraordinary and so evocative, <coughs> isn't it, really? It transports you back to a few centuries into one of these extraordinary entertainments. Um, well, I'm a little bit parched, so... <laughs> 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 so, my final presentation, I've entitled it Culinary Slapstick. And this is really about partying, having fun at the table. Like, for instance, when you have finished drinking from your tatsa, there's no washing up to do because you can actually... Eat it. <laughs> mm. Non è male. Okay. So, for instance, this was something that really got going in the early modern period. This is part of it, you know, having fun with, um, you know, the, the, as I said before, they didn't have television, so you know they turned to other methods of enjoying themselves. So, for instance, if your cook could make something for you, um, like these asparagus spears, which are not asparagus, they're ice cream, um, it was all part of the fun. And actually, what happened in the 18th century was that the various faience and porcelain manufacturers across Europe started producing trompe l'oeil uh, tureens. We've got two wonderful ones in the exhibition, one of a boar's head and one of a turkey. But they made them in the form of bundles of asparagus and melons, and sometimes they look really realistic. So what was real and what wasn't? So it's sort of about the fantasy of fooling you. So, so for instance, um, in, the, in the 16th century, we have directions to make edible playing cards made of exactly the same material, the stuff. And I made these and copied them from an actually set of 16th century real cards. Um, they made playing cards not just out of sugar, but also out of what you may not have in the States. We, have, we call it blancmange. In, um, you know blancmange? It's a sort of jelly, a milk jelly. So these are made out of milk jelly. So you couldn't pick them up. That's part of the fun, you know, because they slide around and you drop them on your lap. In fact, this city, I'll tell you something you don't know, but I do. But amazing bit of knowledge this. There was a company here um, who were operating until the 1960s called Eppelsheimer and Co. And they made ice cream molds. And they actually made a set of ice cream playing card molds. So you could actually play poker with your friends with cards made of ice cream. Of course, you could eat them afterwards. They also made a chess set as well. So when you took, you know, your uh, opponent's piece, you could eat it. <laughs> and that joke goes back a long way because I don't know, there's a wonderful painting by Hans Holbein called The Ambassadors. It's in the National Gallery in London. It's got this amazing kind of perspective of a skull in it. But those French ambassadors w went back to France with a chess set made of sugar, which was a gift from Cardinal Wolsey to Francis I of France. So the joke of having an edible um, set of chess pieces, which you could eat as you played the game, it was all part and parcel of the slapstick, really, of, of the Renaissance period. Um, this is not really bacon and eggs. Again, it's made from jelly. So you've got eggs and bacon sitting on a, a little um, dressing, if you like, of spinach, which is also made out of jelly. And, of course, it's sweet. But everyone thinks this is, you know, great fun. And in the exhibition, um, one of the really notable books that's on display is by um, a German resident of the city of Padova in Italy, um, called Matthias, well, we call him Gige now, don't we, um, rather than Geiger, yes. But um, he was a German Tedesco living in northern Italy, and he produced one of the earliest books that showed you how to fold the, or pinch napkins into these remarkable shapes. And you can see there a rather naughty 
example of his um, napkin folding skills of a cockerel actually, you know, sitting on top of a hen um, in a kind of, well, I think they call it covering in the farming kind of world. Um, And this is an amazingly old joke because below it is the same thing going on in a 19th century catalogue of ice cream moulds, where you could get an ice cream mould where the same joke was being shown. And then on the right um, is a chocolate mould that dates from about 1890. And exactly the same thing, the same joke, and there it is. So I use that mould to, you know, take Jigger's hen and cockerel, a joke that was like 300 years old. It's absolute. The old ones are the best ones, really, I think, you know. But um, a few years ago, um, I was involved in the reconstruction of a remarkable event which took place in Rome on August the 28th, 1714, and a bohemian aristocrat called Johann van Gallas, who was the ambassador um, to the Holy See in Rome, he came down to Rome and hired a palazzo, which is still there, still lived in by the same family. He hired it for a year. It's called the Palazzo Odolskalki. And he actually, on the Holy Roman Empress's birthday, um, Elisabetta Christina, he gave her a, a party in the palace. And he hired 150 Italian people who could make ice creams. And in the interval of an opera that was performed, this is my other little bit of musical kind of link, um, a a wonderful composer called Bononcini composed a a, a sort of, it wasn't really, it was a mini opera, a serenata in two parts called um, A Sacrifice to Venus. And on the 28th of August in 2014, to the day, 300 years later, some friends of mine who had a, a company called Opera Barocca in Prague did the first performance of it for 300 years. And the thing is, it was lost. A musicologist called Teresa Chirico discovered the, um, the libretto in one manuscript in the Imperial Library in Vienna Um, and the actual score in another manuscript that got split up. And I discovered this extraordinary account of the whole occasion, um, which tells you all about it, and it's illustrated with some of the other things that were going on. Outside the palazzo were triumphal arches that had made so all the notables could come to this performance. We actually tried to actually do the performance in the Palazzo Odolskalki, and the Principessa Odolskalki said, I'm terribly sorry, I've lent it to some rich Americans over the summer, <laughs> so you can't have it. So we did So we did it in Prague, in the home of Giovanni um, Clam Gallas, which is this wonderful palazzo. And this is the interval ice cream, of course. In the middle, you can see, again, it's this idea of trompe l'oeil, the idea of something that isn't really what it is. There is a very large garden urn which is made of ice and on the top of the urn is a schuma di cioccolato, a kind of chocolate foam which is the earth in the urn and growing out of it is an artificial tree hung with 150 oranges and lemons hanging from the tree. And on the four tables around the principal one in the middle, all of the other dishes are ices, different types of ice cream, you know, from the early part of the 18th century. Note the date, the 28th of August. This is the Ferragosto. This is the hottest time of year in Rome. These guys had no freezers, no fridges, but they managed to produce something like that. Um, in a morning, which was served. Um, so I was asked, can I reconstruct this for the um, opera, you see? And I said, well, I hope you have a Hollywood budget. And they said, well, you haven't got a budget. <laughs> so we didn't actually do this part of it. We, they did the, the opera. Um, and But they did have a fireworks display. It was performed in the courtyard of the palace. And the firework display was remarkable because there are two groups of figures. One re- represents the River Tiber, 
the Tevere, and on the other side is Neptune, Nettuno, with nymphs in white gowns, like a Gian Lorenzo Benini kind of sculpture, but figures, and they're, they're, they're singing. And suddenly the fireworks start going off behind them, and the, the, f the friend of mine who did the actual set design set the fireworks off. So all these things are going up into the sky above Prague, above the courtyard. But this is Central Europe. And there isn't a fire extinguisher, probably. In the nearest one is probably in Berlin, you know. <laughs> so unfortunately, the, some curtains at the front of the stage caught fire because one of the nymphs knocked a Roman candle over. And Jill and I were sitting in the front row. I was next to the Italian ambassador and the British ambassador was there. And we all rushed forward and we started stamping out the fire. And of course, the show went on, you know, as it always, <laughs> always has to. So we're not going to have any pyrotechnic kind of uh, stunts like that. You know, that is a, the ultimate slapstick. Last slide, basically, is to show you the nature of how ices were made. You saw the asparagus. But this, again, is an 18th century English ice cream with the equipment that was used to make it, in the form of a pineapple, which was a difficult fruit to get hold of. And the mould, if you look carefully, can you see it to the right of the actual pineapple? What you did was you made the ice cream with the pineapple and some cream and some sugar, froze it, and then you cut off the top of the pineapple and you stuck it back on the top of the ice cream. So it looked like a real pineapple. So this kind of fun thing was a really important element in these entertainments, as was the music. So Sonambula once again. <laughs> So we've had a sort of an evolution here with uh, table music from the Schutz music as a social activity, rhetorical to operatic accompaniment, and now we turn to Telemann and to his table music, where music becomes sort of a spectacle, a, a catalyst for conversation, no longer in the background. And so I think I'll, I'll step away and let you continue. Just make sure this is right. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. So, um, we, in all these paintings, um, to just go back a little bit for a moment, in the paintings showing instruments that we saw, um, you may have noticed that the social status of the people depicted also correlated pretty strongly to which of the two families uh, that you see on stage um, shows up. Um, basically, the nicely dressed socially respectable people are playing violas da gamba and the monkeys are playing violins. Um, and in the, from the time of its invention, sometime around the year 1500 to um, sometime into the 17th century, the social vi status of the violin was quite low. It started to rise only in the first decades of the 17th century in Italy, but elsewhere in Europe, it can safely be assumed that if you played the violin, you were little more than a tavern fiddler who had been conscripted to, you know, shave and show up at court one day. Um, but it, uh, that said, by the time you get to Telemann in the writing, in the case of the music we're playing now in the 1730s, the violin was not only socially respectable, but in fact, probably the most prominent um, instrument, uh, solo instrument in most of Europe, at least. And um, with the, along with that came some significant technological innovations. And so I want to make a little switch of equipment, not in the violin, the violin itself will stay the same, but unless I've just broken it, and, but we're going to switch, I'm going to switch from this bow, which is well made quite recently, but modeled on a 1660s uh, bow that is held in a museum in Vienna, it belonged to the composer Heinrich Bieber. And it's quite technologically simple. The only way that the hair is tightened is with this little piece of wood, which pops out. And if I want it to be any tighter than that, I have to stick a little bit of paper or leather into it. It has no tightening mechanism. And it's uh, overall very uh, only scantly 
developed past the medieval bows that had been in that had been in use for five six hundred years. Now, 1760, the day, approximate year of the construction of this bow, you see a huge um, array of changes, starting with the tightening mechanism, which is a screw, which was a tremendous technological achievement. If you consider the screws were made by hand, every single bit of the winding had to be done. Now, screws were... Um, they were a wonderful development for bow technology. They allowed players to have a lot more control over their equipment. They also, unfortunately, resulted in the destruction of a lot of bows because it took a little while for bow makers to figure out that if you left all the winding on the screw, if you wound, had screw, a screw that was wound all the way to the end, when you tightened it, it would gradually eat the interior of the bow out from the inside and thereby destroy the bow. Um, this apparently wasn't used very much between 1760 and 2014 when I had the good luck to find it in a shop. Um, and I quickly got it changed out to a screw that wasn't end-wound so that I wouldn't uh, destroy it and can make use of it. Um, but this is the type of bow that would have been in use um, in by the time Telemann was writing, um, which was really new. This type of bow was only introduced in Germany by the time Telemann was in his late 30s. Um, so he, he would have had most of his career seeing this thing. So big, uh, big shift. Um, just briefly about this music, the Musique de Table from, or Tafel music from which this collection is drawn. Um, this collection of pieces is divided into three productions, each of which starts with music for one solo instrument with basso continuo and gradually grows in the size of the ensemble required until you have a big suite for a big orchestra of the sort that were quite limited in number in Europe at this time. There was the Dresden Hofkapelle, there was the orchestra at Versailles, Mannheim, and not much else. Very few places that could have even done, that could have even presented this music. Um, so it's not terribly clear what Telemann intended by it, except that he was publishing it and he was establishing his reputation and he sold quite a few copies. He was very commercially successful in that respect. But a great deal of it is suitable for a bourgeois music making. And Telemann, although he did have court and church appointments, Telemann was quite entrepreneurial and he represents a kind of new uh, sort of enlightenment uh, capitalist mentality in the sale and production of music, and he's creating music that's accessible to amateurs, can be played in their homes, happens to also be printed alongside this other music that sort of establishes him as the German competitor to Lully or a uh, successor to Shine, who had these big royal productions music um, also in publication. So anyway, without further ado, here's some music.
to say in closing to thank Sonambula for the fantastic performance. <laughs> To, to Andrew Kircher and to Nadia Rivers and to Laura Minsky for the organization and the coordination of this event. <laughs> and finally to Ivan Day for, for bringing his, his humor and his knowledge and his <laughs> I think we've run out of time for Q&A, but we will hang around here. So if you have pressing questions that you want to ask, we'll all be around or in the lobby afterwards. So thank you all for coming, and please enjoy the exhibition.